Hi, this is Nicole. I'm the director at Brooklyn Letters, and I have a very exciting interview today. Um, I'm going to be speaking with speech language pathologist Hetty Johnson. Um, she is going to share with us um, some information about dyslexia and then another exciting area that she's working in with anxiety and how all of that kind of plays in together. So um, I'm just going to let Hetty introduce herself and then we'll start in with the interview. So Hetty, welcome. Thank you, Nicole. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited. Yes, I've been a I have been a speech pathologist for 50 years, which seems crazy to me. I, I got my bachelor's in speech path at Auburn University in 1970, and then my master's in the University of Montevallo in 72. And I've taught on the university level and from preschool up through graduate school, hospitals, nursing homes. Um, I did a traineeship at Duke University back, back in the day in the 70s and at the VA hospital and at Northwestern with laryngectomies and stroke. Since from, from, two, from 1970 to 2000, I was totally speech pathology. And since 2000, I discovered dyslexia and, and it's just been extra fun ever since then. Okay. So, I love exciting. so you um, have so much experience um, and obviously dyslexia is um, a real hot topic um, with, you know, Ch with children and parents and and speech language pathologists and literacy specialists and it's just it's just such an important topic and and needs to be handled with such delicacy and um as you know and as we've talked about um you know our goal at Brooklyn Letters is to educate parents and professionals not only on dyslexia basics uh, but how speech language pathologists can be important players in helping children with dyslexia succeed so um, our professionals, we have um, a large staff of both speech language pathologists and what we term as literacy specialists um, who all work hand in hand um, to help children not only with dyslexia, but with other learning, um, learning issues. Um, so on that end, can you share with us, tell me about, because you've mentioned this, tell me what's the, what has been your connection between speech language therapy, spe being a speech language pathology pathologist and literacy where 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 is that connection taking place oh well that's an awesome question for the first 30 years i didn't even understand about literacy or dyslexia and so i you know i, I it wasn't a focus but in 2000 when i discovered dyslexia and started my orton gillingham training which i've had years and years since then that's when it was so awesome my first and second and third you know, court two week courses every summer, every summer, every summer with Orton Gillingham. I just remember the, at the beginning of one of them, it was like a light bulb just totally went off when they asked what about this was, you know, what was meaningful. And I said that everything I knew as a speech pathologist for 30 years was like honed like a laser all of a sudden onto these students with dyslexia and it all came together in a marvelous way and I I shudder to think how many kids I missed that had, were dyslexic those first 30 years but I had been taught it and it didn't exist you know and and you know how it is there's a lot of resistance so it just all came together and my the speech pathology background is so perfect because of the phonological awareness. I was teaching phonetics at the University of Montevallo back in, in 73, and 74. So phonetics, phonological awareness, so much importance. And the teaching, it's just all came together in a beautiful way. Right, right. And um, tell me, for those that may not know specifically what dyslexia is, and, and I think that the definition of dyslexia has just I don't know that it's changed, but it's expanded possibly so much over the past several years. Share with, with us what, what would be the definition of dyslexia? Well, I love Sally Shaywitz, who wrote Overcoming Dyslexia, and now has a new edition out on that from Yale. I love her. One of her big definitions is that it's an island of weakness in a sea of strengths. And that is so much what you see. The island of weakness is the decoding piece the phonological awareness, playing with sounds in your head. That's what's hard and frustrating. But there is this island of strength. So that would be one, simple. 
definition. And the other that I love to tell my students when I'm, when I'm testing or seeing them is there are three things. So normal intelligence, difficulty with playing with sounds in your head, that phonological weakness and frustration with reading or writing or spelling because of that being the core deficit. And right. so these are, these are kids that have all kinds of strengths and creativity. You know, they're entrepreneurs. Right. They, they tend to have wonderful strengths. Right. And, and probably the third, the third item, the frustration with reading maybe is a lot of times the first step or the first awareness we have a problem. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yes. I mean, such a red flag. Well, maybe delay with speech and our language, especially the language component is a red flag. Difficulty learning to rhyme. Okay. And that comes, comes difficult because rhyming requires playing with sounds in your head. And so, and that they often don't like to, you know, they might love to be read to, but they so much resist. Oh my gosh, those sounds, those letters, they're like not their friends and they have instant, like, not a friendly relationship. Yes, and then the rhyming, yeah. the rhyming aspect, um, I've heard that um, a lot recently from several professionals as being such a key factor, um, which is, I think, interesting for parents um, to note because I think a lot of times they're first, and, you know, and if, there has, if there has not been a clear speech problem up to this point, um, you know, their first identification is, oh gosh, he just really is frustrated with reading. But the rhyming is such an important thing for uh, parents to know because if they identify that in their students, that, that could be a very early red flag. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and they're the kids that don't, they, you know, they avoid wanting to write those letters or play with them. They're not fun to play with. Okay. And so, yes. But we're going to talk about that word fun and enjoyable more. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. So how, just briefly, how have you helped students with dyslexia? What has been your go-to? What's been your training? What have you found to be the most uh, beneficial for your students? Yeah, well, the Orton Gillingham training is just so wonderful. And gosh, I've had so many, you know, starting from the bottom, even if it's an older student. I think about one in particular that she was going into her senior year in high school and doing, making A's and B's because she was memorizing. I mean, that's a big thing you see. They've been memorizing. And when I tested her, tested her, she was reading, she was reading not, I mean, real words, okay, because she'd memorized them, but nonsense words, zero, I mean, six percentile. She saw the first one, IP, and she said, I don't know that. So that was not unusual. And to her, it wasn't. So the memorization. So we worked doing Orton, Orton Gillingham. And I started at the beginning. And like I told her, being so old, I mean, she was driving on car, everything. I said, I know that you know a lot of this, but we need to start at the bottom because there are going to be some cracks in the foundation. And she said, oh, yeah, <laughs> there are cracks. And so we worked. We worked her senior year just twice a week, which normally I would not want to do that. I'd want to do three or more times a week, but we did twice. And she got into Auburn University and she made the Dean's List Civil Engineering her first semester. That's not bad from six percentile reading to Dean's List. And I had taught her these multisensory strategies using like at, you know, I mean, harder words, but at, you know, L, da, da, putting words and do, making it physical. And I remember when she was getting ready to go to Auburn, she said, Hattie, when I get to Auburn, do I have to still do this? And I said, well, do it down on your leg. <laughs> so she did still need that multisensory, but she's now a civil engineer. And another just cool story, this girl was nine, uh, turning 10, when, and, she, and I'll tell her name because she's all about it and you can look her up, Molly Schaefer. Um, Fulbright scholar, okay? Because she's all over the place. But when she was turning 10, she was totally illiterate. And we worked several, you know, several years and she severe dyslexia, but she ended up being the first Fulbright scholar ever from the University of North Alabama. And she spent like year before last in the Czech Republic teaching English. And right. now she's like been a museum curator and yeah, she's amazing. And you could Google, you know, Fulbright Scholar Dyslexia, and you'll, you can read about Molly. But that's she's another cool. That's another very cool. Very exciting. So, 
So um, if you have a parent who um, suspects that their child may um, have dyslexia, um, what should they do? What, what's the first step? What should they do? Yeah, I would get, him, get the child diagnosed, get the child tested. Hopefully if the schools will do it, and if not, I mean, I know a lot of the time people have a hard time getting it done, but hopefully they won't have a difficulty there. But if not, to search out someone who specializes in dyslexia, um, such as y'all's office, you know, to get testing done and to start and to make it fun and to help that child realize how amazing they are. I like to say anybody who's anybody is dyslexic because mm -hmm. there's, there's so much wonderfulness there. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and then um, we're we're in New York State, so um, in New York, and um, the way that things work is that in order to um, receive an actual actual dyslexia diagnosis, you have to have that diagnosed by a neuropsychologist. So go through an entire you know neuropsychological evaluation. I know that there are different um, different processes in different states, um, but that's what we have to. Do. Here. But what we can do, um, although we do not have any neuropsychologists that actually are staffed by Brooklyn Letters, we do have several neuropsychologists that we work very closely with that we highly recommend and um, that we can then refer our clients to those neuropsychologists. We can, can, we can start working with those students. Um, you know, we have literacy specialists and speech language pathologists that are Orton Gillingham certified and trained and, and can go ahead and start those processes. But to actually receive the diagnosis, we would then need to refer them to a neuropsychologist. But we all work together. Um, and I think that's the most important is just getting to someone who can give them the next step and where they need to go from here. And one thing I'd like to add to what mm -hmm. I said is aside from that part, to be sure that your student is getting to do what they love, mm -hmm. you know, to, to let them do what they excel at and love and to not let that be taken away because of their grades. I yeah. think of like the Fonz, Henry Winkler, the Fonz, who was dyslexic and, and is, and he's very public about it. I don't know if you've heard him speak about it, but like when he was 16, when he was in high school, they wouldn't let him be on the drama team because of his grades. Mm -hmm. And how sad is that? Right. Because that was his strength, right? Okay, so um, what are just some general tips that you would give parents if they have a child who's struggling with dyslexia? You just gave us one. Allow them to um, engage in those activities that are enjoyable to them and that they're their strengths. But any other tips that you would give parents aside from actual um, being treated for that? Yes, making everything physical, making it fun and physical. That the like I like to talk to my kids and, and go through this, that this part of your brain is like hearing, uh, touching and moving, lights up in the parietal lobes if you're touching and moving, temporal lobes if you're hearing it and hearing and talking lights up, um, occipital lobes lights up if you're seeing and that that's this magic Orton-Gillingham triangle in your brain. And so it's important that these dendrites, these neurons that fire together, wire together. That's Hebb's law, Donald, Donald Hebb. And so it's so important to be playing. Like I would be like jumping rope while they're doing their homework. You know, anything, sorry to go away from you for a second. Um, whatever they would be working on, if, you know, if they were to take their study guide and whatever it was that they were working on, if like maybe if it was about word parts like this, meaning down or away, or um, you know any kind of any kind of like word word parts like act like to do and to make or if it was like the water cycle evaporation condensation could be anything they're working on and this is through like I worked with a law student just the other night on Zoom it's any subject law school kindergarten it doesn't matter but to put on things like paper plates and then like I would say like act to do and I would check it and say oh yeah I'm right Woo! and I throw it like a frisbee and <laughs> you know astronaut I, lots of astronauts are dyslexic and I throw it astronauts to make anything they're learning into a game okay and, and I'm mm -hmm. Would you say that, um, just because I, I know this from experience, I think I already know the answer to this, but um, by, by doing something physical, 
does that, it taps into an area of their brain that kind of, I don't know how to phrase it, circumvents the, the, the stumbling block they're having. I, I know my son, when he stutters, one of the um, early on, one of the techniques that they had him do was physically holding a slinky. And as he would say a sentence, she would have him pull the slinky out. So when he did that, he would not stutter because his concentration was on the physical movement of moving, fluently moving the slinky, which kind of hyper, it, it, it took the place of the, the you know, the, the stuck that he was with his words. Then when he was older um, and, or he would be out in public, she said, you know, instead of using a slinky, just use your hands, just, just do this. And then you will get to a point when you're older that you don't even have to use your hands. You can visualize in your brain the movement, of, you know, the pulling out of a slinky as you're saying your sentence. And it was extremely effective. And what she had told us was that his, his physical concentration on this slinky um, kind of triggered another part of his brain and helped him get through his, with his fluency. And is that true? Yes, yes. And I have my slinky, but it's out in the car right now. <laughs> and so, but I, I so much love my slinky and we use it. The, po the point of all that, as you just said, is that you're activating that magic multisensory triangle. Because when you're doing the slinky, you're touching and moving and you're talking and you're hearing and you're seeing and when you're throwing things. And I love to use like, um, you know, like, anything that we can just throw like if for so for parents when they're doing homework I would I so much like to tell the student that that it's not your mom and dad's job to come up with activities because I don't want to lay it on them I tell the student it's your job and your parents are they're allowed to help but it's your job because you're going to be better you know what you love you can turn whatever you're doing into a dance into a cheer into gymnastics you do your moves do what you love while you yell it out or basketball like I had a student teenager that like he took a chalk a sour chalk and made a chalk line uh, from his mailbox to his basketball goal and he put these paper plates of whatever he was studying he was 16 and he would dribble the ball going and then shoot a basket you might make play horse play some kind of basketball game using it could be sight work it could be spelling it could be you know the steps in a water cycle it could be chemistry right you know right and very, so yeah very interesting. did i answer your question yeah, yeah very much so um, and i think we see that over and over um you know with my son's stutter as well you know poetry and um, things that have a, a, a beat or a rhythm and um, a natural beat or a rhythm and he, when he does those things doesn't stutter and you know it, it, it's almost like you're tricking the brain by having it do one thing but it forgets that you're not able to do the other thing and um, we've seen this time and time again with the different activities that he does and it sounds very similar to what you're talking about um, so it's, it's just it, the brain it, the brain is the most fascinating thing and that is a perfect segue into an area that you are very into and that you are excited to talk about and I'm excited to hear about. And that is on uh, the, the neuro neurological side of anxiety, the brain and, and, and anxiety and kind of how it relates to this, you know, all of these topics that we've been talking about. So tell me how you made that change in your professional life you're in your practice to this whole idea of anxiety share with me kind of how that happened yeah you give me chills because it is it's such a dear to my heart okay so i've been a speech path at this point 42 years this is 2012 and it like crystallized i was in the car i mean it was like you know how you just have a thought come and it crystallized everything because i was so known in fact <laughs> my friends would call me the queen of strategies because I was always teaching strategies and always into strategies. And it was like I heard in my brain, I actually felt these words that said, okay, you do all these strategies, but if they're shut down, nothing works. Mm -hmm. And it was my, it just changed my life. And so since 2012, 
I mean, I was already obsessed. <laughs> now I am like hyper obsessed mm -hmm. because I've seen such amazing results. And it's based on neurology. And I would love, you know, like learning to like Judy Willis is a neurologist and all of her books are so wonderful. She's all about the amygdala. And it's, and it's just, and so it's all this approach. And I present, I actually taped one this morning, a webinar giving, and I would love to do it again with y'all if you wanted, but with a group out of Virginia, uh, it's going to be called the Dyslexia Summit or Embrace Dyslexia, and it's coming out. And so I did it this morning, a whole thing on it, and I would love to do it because <laughs> it's like my life. It just is so incredible. To tell you just the whole point of it is that like um, Goldie Hawn, Goldie Hawn is into the, into the amygdala also, and I heard her speak in Los Angeles in 2017 when I presented SPA at ASHA, and I presented it around the country and in London, right out of London, but Goldie Hawn is also into it, mm -hmm. and, and she also works with this same neurologist on her board, um, but this, she talks about how the amygdala that all the sensory information has to go through the amygdala and the amygdala asks only, basically just asks, is this going to be pleasurable? Okay. And if the answer is no, it's going to slam down, crash into fight or flight, and it gets worse from there. Like if the amygdala ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, is what I like to say. <laughs> and But if the amygdala, if like with this spa thing, that I, these strategies that I would love to teach, if we can teach, give the student the power to know and how to do it, that they can help their amygdala stay reassured. We're not tricking the amygdala, but the amygdala gets tricked by the sphere. Right. You know, like I'll ask them, yeah, I might say, is that spelling test really going to kill you? Is that chemistry really going to kill you like a lion? And they'll laugh and they know it won't. So we talk about if it's not really going to kill you, how to reassure your brain by self-talk and by the parents and teachers using talk. It's just normal talk. It's just reassuring talk. And I'd love to talk about that. And so that then it will immediately send it to thinking, to where you have executive functions, all the focusing, motivation, everything. And then it goes to memory and so I like to think of it as this brain if you get your fists up this is the pinkies if you wiggle your pinkies that's like the vision in the back the thumbs are the prefrontal cortex where thinking and learning is the amygdala is the tips of your index fingers this came from Judy Willis okay. and, and the middle finger is the hippocampus which is where the memory storage is so we want this amygdala to check out stuff and we tell it I'm okay. Be reassured, amygdala. <laughs> Be reassured you're, it's is safe. So then it will send it to thinking. It will pump your brain full of dopamine, which is joy, and which Judy Willis calls a memory chip. And it, it, it enhances all the executive functions automatically. And it's free. It's free. So it'll pump your brain full, make you happy, make you connect learning with joy which is so important. That's why learning to love learning. I would just put the word learning here. Right. If we teach our students to learn to love learning, that's the whole, you know, that's the whole battle. Right. And so anyway, and you know, otherwise if the amygdala thinks this is not really pleasurable, it crashes you down and it's just awful. Um, one student that he was 19 years old, and I'll stop at my examples with him, although I have a million I'd like to give, but he was 19. He was flunking out of the University of Alabama, making 30s and 40s, bad flunking out. And I did this with him in a whole day when I actually tested him too, but that's the only time I ever saw him. And when I, I talked to his dad just a couple, two or three months later and asked how he was doing, and he looked at me and he said he's making straight A's. Yeah, and it's amazing. And I and I will say about that. It's like I didn't have to teach him how to be smart. Right. I had to teach him how not to shut down. And I did teach him about multisensory strategies and making it fun. And that's made the difference. Huh. Okay, so a couple of things. I jotted down some notes while you were talking because I want to make sure we cover all these. You and I off camera, we talked about my son, who I've mentioned more than once, 
um, one of the areas that he um, will really struggle with in his schooling is with with anxiety. Um, you know, he'll have a, a difficult subject. Chemistry this year has been just a oh, poor guy. Um, but he, you know, he he's done it and 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 he's struggled through, but he's he's kept with it and he's done it. But where he will really have problems is he in that beginning stage. He has a, an assignment coming up, and before he's even really even read through the assignment, his anxiety has already gone to a level that when it's time to start the assignment, he is unable to take the steps necessary to complete it because he's so anxious about even the concept of the of, of this assignment that he doesn't even know the specific. So anxiety is is definitely um, the area. So it got me thinking about um, a lot of our clients. Um, executive function is it, executive functioning has always been here, but now it has a, a, a name, and it's it's fairly recent. And and we hear a lot of, of parents contacting us about you know executive function. My child needs help with executive function. It's big. So thinking about my son, thinking about all of our clients, or many of our clients, um, so what you're saying is by working through this anxiety that they have, then it's able to um, get them to the level where they're able to tap into their executive functioning skills and move forward. That's very, that's very important because parents are very frustrated that their children are lacking these executive functioning skills and they want to know how do we solve this and really it probably is tied a lot to anxiety is that true yeah i would say gosh i would so much say yes to that it i mean i think that's the answer the key to life is dopamine like the amygdala releases that dopamine which is joy which makes you attach learning to fun and happiness and if we don't have that all is lost Really, I mean, I tell my parents, you know, if, if, if work, if the work isn't fun, the work doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's so true. Um, you know, I'd like to go through the whole thing, but this is really important. The P of spa is point out like the S of spa. This is a student made this picture of a spa, a brain in a hot tub. And, but the S is self-talk and the P is point out only what's right. And that's something I could ask parents to to point out only what's right, but to say something like, "You, no matter, even if it's just one little thing, you got this right, and now we can get these. And so I'm not ignoring, that's code for their wrong, but the amygdala is going to be happy. You got this right. And the other thing that I learned from a dyslexic young man who was 35 is he said what shut him down was his parents would say, and we all say this, okay? We all say this and we think we're helping. His parents would say, but you know this. Mm. And they would say, yeah. And they would say, well, remember? We, remember? And don't, don't we all say that? But he said it shut him down. It, he said it, it crushed him because it made him think, if I knew it, I wouldn't have missed it. Mm. And it made him think, I must have something really wrong with my brain. So instead of saying you know this, I want to say, oh, remember? Because then we think, oh, I'm supposed to remember, but I don't. But to say, you got this right, and now, and for us to help them save face, that's huge. To help them feel like, you, I'm not going to let you be embarrassed. And I would take the blame. I would want the parents to say, oh, my gosh, that's, that's my fault. Let me think of a better way to explain that. I just didn't present it very well. And don't let them take the blame. It's not their fault. They, if they could, they would. So, yeah, um, Well, on that topic, we, we know that S is self-talk. We know that P is point out only what's right. What is A? Advocate for yourself. So if someone is making you feel in danger or just unsure, to know that you can speak out, you can ask. And I got this, especially from G. Emerson Dickman, who is who was president of IDA and is um, and is dyslexic and is an internationally known special ed attorney, wonderful. And Rob Langston, who is also dyslexic, they both spoken tons and tons at IDA, but they both published those self advocacy kind of ideas in either their work or their talks. And I have permission to share that. And that helps with anxiety from the outset as well. And again, I'll bring up my son. That is a huge area with, with 
um, people who stutter, persons who stutter, and we're part of the uh, National Stuttering Association, and their philosophy is advocacy. That is basically, the, you know, it's acceptance and advocacy, and teaching these, especially teenagers who are new, children who are new, how to self-advocate, how to let others know I am a person who stutters. Um, but that that is that's huge because that cuts down on anxiety. Just doing that cuts anxiety in half. Just getting you know the elephant in the room kind of thing. Get it get it out there, and, and, and so you can move on from it. So is that part of advocacy? Yes, yes, yes. Just whatever you need to help your amygdala stay calm and not feel threatened. And one. An, an example of a, a young man that had a 15 year old who had severe brain damage from a car accident and and he was in the hospital coma in hospital for six months and six weeks coma and anyway but when they let him out he had never made a voice at all and he was couldn't swallow and all and the parents asked if i could come help them because of a connection in our families that they asked me and when i went to see him he had an index card in his back pocket and had he wrote out because he couldn't talk, but he's pointed the letters and put, I can talk, but I forgot how. Mm-hmm. And he was a normal 15 year old who was an, a, you know, he was an advanced AP student, brilliant. And so we, it's a long, it's not, it doesn't need to be a long story, but we worked, you know, we got to work and we worked, we worked, we worked for like, and it'd been three and a half weeks and I hadn't gotten anything. Okay. And I'd always have the parent with me always in case something happened, which it didn't. And so, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm anxious on the inside, but I couldn't show it. But the next time when I went to see him, and now it'd been almost seven months with no voice. Okay. And he came to the door and he said, hi. And he had his, he had his voice totally back, although he was nasal. And then, so what I just know, even though that was about 15 years ago, before I had spot. But I knew this stuff. I knew the neurology. I knew these things. What I did is I did spa for those three and a half weeks. I pointed out only what was right, which was nothing. Okay. Yeah. He never got what I wanted. But I would say, yes, you're breathing. I mean, that's really <laughs> digging. But I'd say, yes, yes, you're pushing. Because we were practicing uh, pushing to make uh, strength. You, yes, you pulled, or yes, you're looking at me, or yes, you're here, or yes, you're trying. And so I bragged on him for three and a half weeks, but I was dying on the inside. But I think, I'm sure that what happened, his amygdala, which was shut down, it's only, you know, get, win, win, or lose, lose. I think he, even though those people at the hospital were good, but I think he knew he wasn't getting it. And he was shut down. And after three and a half weeks of him thinking, I'm doing everything right, it came back all at once. Yeah. It's all in, like the amygdala. Sorry for that long story. No, oh, no, that's excellent because that actually um, kind of ties in with a follow up question that I have. And we'll probably end. Um, I have a couple more little things, but we'll, we'll end here in a minute. But I was thinking about students, especially, I, I don't want to say especially, but in, in the New York area, I think it would not be a shock that schools, um, especially private schools, they're very competitive. Um, students, they ask a lot of their students. Um, and so we, we, let's say we have a student, let's say we have a, a sixth grader who is in a middle school program um, in New York and, he, you know, it's time for them to already start thinking about, um, you know, the application process for high school that's coming up. I mean, all of these things are, are kind of out there for him. And he's in a rigorous school program and it's very detailed, you know, difficult courses. They're asking a lot of him. And he is experiencing this anxiety. You know, we mentioned that we, the amygdala needs, you know, it needs to have joy. And, and, but, you know, his schoolwork probably is not fun. You know, it's, it's difficult work, but he has to do it because that's the program he's in. So you're not talking about let's take your assigned, let's take what you're doing and make every moment of your schoolwork fun. But you're talking more about how can we take that difficult schoolwork and make it to where your, your amygdala believes that it's enjoyable so that you can kind of move through this process. So what I'm thinking is we can't stop doing difficult work just because it's not fun. But how do, how do parents, how do we as parents with children in these very rigorous school programs help their child 
through that. And I think that's what spa is. So take that sixth grader and tell me what, what we would do with him based on your, your spa situation. Yeah, I would, I really would try to, I want to make all of it actually fun. I want to, I, like, I've done it with medical students, with law students. One that I just I mentioned I did, and he was, and it, it really, I want to make everything fun. I want, but, but I want them talking to their brain and telling themselves, you know, the self-talk, the S, is like to tell yourself, like he hated he was doing terrible, this law student, doing bad in legal writing, and he would just have legal blocks, and he's brilliant. He had been voted, you know, most likely to succeed in high school, in a big high school. I mean, and here he was struggling, and COVID had just happened. He's a freshman mm -hmm. in Atlanta. You know, all of a sudden, I mean, it all fell apart. And so, but with that legal writing course that he was just struggling with, he, we were practicing saying, I love legal writing, and I, and I know it seems crazy, but it works because I love, uh, I learned this from a doctor who was dyslexic and the first time I gave this talk in 2012 and she got up at the end and she said they're medical school. That's what she, she gave me. I love this. I didn't know that I would, but she said, she would say, I love this about whatever she was failing all through medical school. I love microbiology. And, and, and she said that she would invariably end up loving it, making an A, and it would become her best class. And that you can still hear that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Then, so that's what I'm, and then a, a man, a daddy, told me the same story one time about that with his, was algebra two in high school. He ended up majoring in math, even though he hated it, but he made himself love it by saying, I love, and it's amazing. So that part is so important about, and, and then, but one of my things is just to say, I'm just having trouble. I can do this. I know I can do this. So that, you know, but I want them to make up their own. So this law student, he emailed me a few days later. Well, he, that night he did about how excited he was, but a few days later and said, I'm fi almost finished with my legal writing course. And he signed it. I love legal writing. It becomes a joke, but, <laughs> but it's real because saying that gives your amygdala the, of the impression, oh my gosh, she actually loves this. I didn't know that. I thought she hated it. Right. If once we can get the amygdala on board, it pumps out dopamine, pumps out memory. You learn it easier. It gives you executive function, which you didn't have when you're in fight or flight. I really put it to hard stuff. I put it to chemistry. I put it, and I don't think, and you know, if something people could Google was Sean Sanders, University of Michigan, dyslexia. And on, on their site, he gives, he gives what he used in law school and it's some really cool stuff. And it, so it goes to hard stuff. I would, right. I think it needs to be everywhere. <laughs> I know that might seem realistic. Definitely. So if the, if the school, if the classroom itself is not practicing um, these type of techniques, these are things that parents can help to teach their children and to reinforce with the, with the P, the pointing out only what's right. And so these are, it's not all, all is not lost if the school is not on board with this philosophy is what I'm saying. Right, right. I mean, it'd be nice if they were on board, but they use, they're almost never on board. Right. And so unless it's a special school for learning issues, right. um, but it's so important. And exercise is so important. We yeah. do the like free, like seven app, it's just a number seven. I would recommend everybody does something like that. And exercise is crucial. Right. John Rady, R A T E, was a psychiatrist, and it's in my handout it, it, when I do my program. But anyway, it's called Spark about exercise in the brain. And it's so crucial to exercise because that gives you dopamine. Right. It all goes together. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, let's see. Um, anything else that we haven't covered? about your findings. I, it's interesting that you know, we started out talking about dyslexia and, and these, this spa um, technique obviously works wonderful with dyslexia, but also works wonderfully with so many um, learning challenges and, and other challenges. But is there anything that just stands out that you would want to share um, about you know, anxiety and executive functioning? Anything that we haven't covered that you feel like is super important for parents to hear? Wow. That, that it, it doesn't have to just even be about learning. I've done, I did it with a five-year-old child who had a phobia about 
water and flooding and pooping. He would go days and days without pooping. And it was really bad behaviorally and everything. And we did this with him, five years old. And before the session was over, he said, I need you to go to the bathroom. And he went and he came back and said, that never happened before. He said, it came right out, which is funny. But, and then like I've done it with, with seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, with well, six and seven-year-olds with, with batting, like in batting little, you know, and that they were striking out, even though they had been home run hitters. Right. Now they're in a slump. And did it with them, and they went back to hitting home runs. And it's, you know, and I'm doing it now with a stroke patient who's 55 years old that I just, a friend asked me to see her. So starting April 29th was my first time to see her. And she, her anxiety was terrible. She had a stroke three years ago when she was 52. It's just, and I told my friend, I said, I haven't done stroke for 35 years. But I, but I said, you know, and the, the sister said, but I think she has it in her. She knows she understands, but she just couldn't get it out. She had lost her speech except for just random single words. And I have a video clip of us that maybe I could show you later. It's 43 seconds on May 5th. We had only been working like, you know, a few days online. But she came out with the first sentence she had ever said. Mm -hmm. Talking to her amygdala, we were saying, stop. We were practicing. I, we had done this. Plus, you know, bringing in all kinds of things, just anything to trigger her speech. And, and so we were saying, stop it, Rain. You can't shut me down. And so she's saying that. And then she can't. But it's very halting. Very, very, very halting. But then she says, watch over me, which is her first sentence. And it was like, oh my gosh. And then Sunday, I did another video and she is just screaming with me, dopamine, superpowers. And it sounds almost that good. I mean, she, she can get messed up, but she is doing, you know, amygdala. And she knows that this is free. Like I asked her on the video, I said, is that, do you have to pay a lot for this dopamine and joy or is it free? And she, that free. Right. And she understands it is free and there are no bad side effects. Right. Right. So, it's what, yeah, and that, that's yeah. very important. You know, we can all tap into that. We just need to know how. And that's what you teach. So tell us, where can our listeners find you? Where can they find you to learn more about this? Well, if they could Google Hetty Johnson Dyslexia, H-E-T-T-I-E, -E, Johnson Dyslexia, they could actually see a, a video from 2008 that's on, well, I have three of them online about spa. They could Google Hetty Johnson Spa Strategies, okay. and they would come up with that 2018 talk. But back then, I've changed it. I mean, it's still so good, but I used to call it positive mistake correction for okay. the P. But point out what's right is much more descriptive. And so I think what I'm doing now is better, but they could watch that one. Um, they could, but, and my email is hettyj at gmail.com, H-E-T-T-I-E-J. -E -E and a Spring Valley school is a school here in Birmingham for dyslexia and, and other um, learning, learning issues. And they, they started what's called the Hetty Johnson Institute. Uh -huh. And so, I hate to say that because it seems embarrassing. Oh, no, but they were that proud. <laughs> but that, so they could Google that and see a, a lot of little short videos, one minute, two minute videos I've done about learning strategies. And it was actually started by the mother of the Fulbright Scholar. Okay. okay. The girl right. is getting her count. She almost has finished with her count, the certified academic language therapist and, and, you know, is the Dean of Humanities there at Spring Valley. And so she named it that. And I kept saying, you don't have to name it that. <laughs> but she said, but I want to. And she, when we started working, this was something that I've never forgotten way back when Molly was nine and now she's married and like 25, I guess. But she wrote, Gladys wrote me and said, thank you for restoring the joy to our lives. Right. That's what this does. That is so amazing, Hetty. I'm really super excited that you came on and talked to us. And um, it sounds like it sounds so simple if we just all tap into it. So, um, and, and that's what happens. And um, you know, our goal is we want we want everyone. But it, you know, in our business, you know, we're talking about you know children and teenagers who are just struggling um, with things that so many of us take for granted. 
Um, and, um, you know, I'm hopeful that these types of techniques and, and this type of work um, will be of benefit to families um, so that, you know, they can add that extra component into what they're doing to help their children. And um, we just want them to succeed. I mean, that's that's what it's all about. So um, I will be sharing this with the masses and hoping that um, we help lots of individuals. Thank you, Nicole. You've let me do, talk about my favorite subject. <laughs> so um, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, great. Well, we will, uh, I'm sure we will be in touch more. We might um, entertain an idea of doing some type of um, a webinar or something of that nature in the future um, for our families and our clients and, and help you out with that. And we'll just be in touch about that. Yes, that's good. I would love it. Thank you so much. And y'all stay safe and healthy. Uh, you too. Bye.